about the impact that this film has had already, the ripples um, that this film, as well as, of course, Mary Reynolds' life herself, uh, has had. So uh, we'll, we'll just be about 10 or 12 minutes here or so. Liz, of course. Hi. Does anybody have any questions about the film at all? If you could just start us off by um, answering that question about the ripples, like how has this film impacted from your experience of what you know? Well, interestingly enough, um, when Mary and I started this insane journey, um, I, I had wanted to do a wild garden in my house. I had, I had worked as an attorney in Chicago for probably 20 years, and I really, I lived in a high rise, and I really craved getting back to the nature of my childhood which is in West Cork in Ireland, where a lot of these, the opening sequences are shot and where Future Forest is. And um, I wrote a design brief when I returned to Ireland in like 2004, no, 2003, I think, and sent it out to three big international designers. And they sent me back drawings that had nothing to do with me, called for uh, no right angles, all wild native species, hawthorns, a fairy blade, and kind of rooms in the garden. And I wanted, to, you know, it was my, my ultimate wish list. I, I voted effect around the house, and I wanted the theme to be Celtic Zen. And somebody then said to me, oh, you don't want any of those people. You want Mary Reynolds. She's Irish. She just won the Chelsea Flower Show last year. That was 2002 with the Wild Garden, and it created a sensation. It was all over world media when it happened because she's the youngest person ever to win the Chelsea Flower Show, which is a huge deal in London. It starts the London season, and three million people walk through the whole garden within a period of, um, you know, four days. And it's great for selling t-shirts, actually, <laughs> I found. So, um, uh, so, so I, she came back to me about six months later with such an extraordinary garden that I had to, I had to figure out how to pay to build it. And um, in, 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 in the design of that garden and in our work together, 
she, she told me the theme of the garden, by the way, was Celtic Zen. And one of the things she did was she, she wrapped right around the house on a kind of a, a platform terrace these two pools that are, are, are like yin and yang. And so when the sun comes over the mountains that you see there in the movie and these lakes and everything that the garden was to be integrated into, it hits the pools and it lights up my living room at about 6 p.m. with special effects and it's great. <laughs> Um, so, so that was where the story started for us, but before that I had had, I guess, uh, cancer back in 1993, probably from working too hard as an attorney and hating every minute of it because all I ever wanted to be was a scriptwriter and director. And uh, I, I, um, after that my, 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 my husband said to me, you know, an idea is worth nothing until it's executed and you've all these ideas and you never write them down. So I said, okay, when I was doing chemotherapy, I got books about script writing and I started to learn, you know, how, 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 to, how to script write. And one of the first things I wrote was, I, I love science fiction, you know, I love Blade Runner and Alien and all of these. And one of the first things that I wrote was called Breathe and it was based on Gaia theory. And you hear the Gaia theory kind of rolling message-wise through the movie. Um, that the Earth is a big superorganism that was self-correct, if you give it a chance. Gaia theory was, was developed in the 1930s and 40s by an Oxford Don, who's still alive, a Cambridge Don, called James Lovelock. And I'm sure you know, everybody kind of knows what Gaia theory is loosely based now. But the whole point of this was that what Mary and I wanted to do was we, we wanted to bring wild nature back into that little space you control yourselves, your own gardens and everybody can do that. And conceptually, for example, just one example, uh, a typical mowed lawn, which really only became fashionable during the reign of Charles II, because obviously very few people other than Louis XIV and Charles II could afford to have lawns, but it became aspirational and then it moved to America with, the, with Scottish uh, immigrants and it, it got converted into tennis courts and golf courses, and the next thing it's in every suburb, and at some point every suburb in America have to have a lawn of a regulation length, and if you'd any weeds or anything, somebody would send you a little notice. And now, of course, we've separated ourselves so much from nature that we no longer support nature. So, uh, to, to give an example of, of how this has kind of proliferated, because the movie is actually just been sold to a distributor in America literally this week. In fact, I'm leaving here tonight to photocopy and sign the documents for the US distributor that's going to take it out. Which is nice. But it's already been to, you know, to Japan and China and Israel and the Gulf states and Brazil, and it's been all over the place. And it's just funny, it took a kind of a very strange and unusual tour because I don't know if you're really also aware of this, and I'll come back to the question in a second, it's a roundabout way of saying through my braces, my daughter's a cosmetic dentist and she insisted I bored my teeth down and I needed to do something or I'd lose them all by the time I was a hundred, she told me. So, uh, you know, you make your first movie in your fifties and everybody thinks you're a freak and you better have long teeth. Um, so, um, she, she, sorry, where was I? I'm sorry. <laughs> Where was I going? Oh yes, so so one of the first crowds of people that somebody in LA showed was, was a, there's a garden in Beverly Hills called Virginia Robinson Gardens. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's, a, it's the only kind of public garden in Virginia Hills, or in, in Beverly Hills, left to the, 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 the township of Beverly Hills by somebody called Virginia Robinson, who was a Pullman heiress as far as I remember. It's a beautiful garden. And um, they decided they wanted, they saw the movie on a, on a screener on their computers, the head of the gardens, and he got all the committee, who was kind of a who's who of, you know, old Hollywood, uh, to agree that they would actually rewild the garden. And then they had me show up for a public screening in February of that year. And I had seen Virginia Robinson Gardens before, because when I go to places, I always go and look at gardens. And it was a micromanaged garden with the most perfect lawns. There was not one piece of clover or any weed in the Virginia Robinson's gardens. But when I arrived, they had taken all their old lawns out and they had rewilded their lawns and planted it with clover so that the bees could, you know, have bee time in it. And the, one of the points about the film is, and if you all, if you take nothing else away today, perhaps you can think about this. A typical mowed lawn 
which is usually full of pesticides and herbicides and eats water and you have to mow it all the time, it can't support one bee. But a clover lawn, which only has to be mowed once a year, no toxic downside for beehives, can support a myriad of pollinators. So imagine your clover lawn and then a hundred of them and then a thousand of them. Imagine if everybody in this room decided it's a very easy thing to do. You literally cut your grass very short and you cut put clover seed on it. And it, it, it takes a couple of years to really look right and then it's unbelievable. And in the evenings you hear that lovely hum and your garden's actually alive. And you can also, most gardens, whether it's postage stamp size or whether it's um, you know, a, a large average kind of garden with lawns and stuff can support one tree which has foliage that falls onto the ground and you can probably have a little food source. And so the, the idea is to, to, and if any of you are interested, Mary has a book that's being sold in the lobby called Garden Awakening. And it literally is a how-to of forest gardening, of how to rewild that little space you control yourself, your own gardens. Because I feel in these days, when everybody is so concerned about climate change, we actually have the power in our own gardens to take that back and make that space a wild space. And this all came from the philosophy of ancient Celtic Ireland, where the ancient Celts at harvest time would leave a corner of their fields uncut for the natural animal, for, for the native animals to survive. And that corner was known, that corner of the uncut harvest fields was known in ancient Ireland as the hare's corner. And farmers today still in Ireland keep a little area of their fields so that the hares of the small native animals will survive. And even if you still must have mowed lawns or whatever whatever it is you want, you can still create an actual natural natural area in your garden that attracts pollinators and so on. Because really, if the, Einstein even said that if the bees you know, don't survive, we don't survive. We've got four years after the death of the bee populations. And it, 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 it's crazy what we're doing to the earth, but nobody really seems to take it to heart or, or know how to manage it within our own individual lives. And it, it gives us some individual power, which I think is very important. And the movie, as it went out into different countries, you know, in Australia, they've now got a school program. And I believe they have this in a, in a lot of townships in America as well. But they're trying to get you know, the movie on the school curriculum so the children really understand. And one of the loveliest things that happened, I mean, there's many stories of, that I hear. You know, Somebody will see the movie in a plane and they'll write to me and they say, I've just planted a tree in the garden and I'm doing clover lawns or something. It's just really nice to see it on your Facebook set. But, but one of the stories was one of the producers who was particularly hard to work with on the movie said, OK, I just showed my seven-year-old the movie and she's now locked in her room. <laughs> and I said, Oh, okay. And she said, go away, Daddy. I'm designing a wild garden. <laughs> so I thought that was a nice one. So there's been, there's been lots of you know, great stories about the movie, but we, you know, we have a huge concern that even when we distribute it in America, like the average distribution cost is about five million. So I have people going out at the moment really looking for sponsorship. And this is only in the last few weeks since this process started. And if any of you know anyone, and we've got some very kind sponsors here I, I, that, that Jenny has talked about, but if any of you know anyone who's you know, a big environmentalist and really understands the concept, you know, we greatly appreciate any help we can get. What else? <laughs> um, I'm just make one, one, yeah. um, one little comment that the first group didn't know. We're gonna try to get Mary Reynolds here for next year for a 2.0 um, event. And hopefully we're going to seek some funding for um, some sort of town, land area, or some some public place, and have her over in September of this year, and then have her create a design, and then come back and hopefully get the funding to build it somewhere really cool. So whether it's the trust, whether Brian Fairfield knows of somebody or Tara Pinner, anyway, it'd be really somebody cool. Somebody knows somebody. <laughs> somebody knows somebody somewhere. Um, yeah, Mary is an extraordinary designer, and she was actually, as, as the credits at the end say, the youngest person ever to win Chelsea. Uh, she was 26, in fact, 25 when she started, 26. And the real Christie was, was uh, three years younger, in fact. And some of the funny things we did with the movie as well, like the movie is very much about the power of intentional thought. And when I met Mary, she said, well, I said a mantra, I wrote it on the fridge door. 
and you should start a mantra now because you know you have to hope for making this movie. So I started a mantra. <laughs> And I, I said the mantra on for such time, and the really weird thing about saying a mantra is I, I find it very, you know, I'm an attorney by training, you know. Um, so, so it was very weird for me. I started saying this mantra, and the curious thing about it is I think it so focuses you that every day you do something in the furtherance of your goal, and you go down many blind alleyways, but you never stop. You know, so now the, the big movie, which is this, is, this becomes the the foundation stone for Breathe, which is set 150 years into the future based on Gaia theory. And you know, it's a big sci-fi epic. It's also a big romance, because you know, we like romance, and God knows we hardly see any romantic movies anymore. Like it's not allowed, it's not cool, or I, you know, it's not dark, tortured, and edgy, therefore you may not do it. Um, you know, if it's not twisted and weird, like, you know. So, um, so I decided when I was starting out, even though my partner said, don't do that, don't do one of your, you know, your really historical epics about that Renaissance prince that's so evil and it's really violent and full of political intrigue and sex. And he said, that would really be easy, you know. And I said, no, I want to do this one first. And he said, you're crazy, you're doing a story about gardening, no one's going to go. <laughs> and uh, anyway, lots of people have gone all over the world so far, so I'm kind of glad about that, I proved him wrong. And now he's like the biggest fan of the movie, he loves it. And tortures everybody like listen to you know about it but um, I, I think it's very important too that um, the story of the real life characters Christy Collard and Mary Reynolds actually what happens inside the movie affects life outside the movie I mean I've even had a journalist write to me and say I left your movie and I went out and, and planted wildflowers in my garden the next day it makes people want to do wild things <laughs>